So in this episode of the podcast, we're going to be talking about a perennial favorite subject, which is bad bosses. Don't want to miss it. Stay tuned. You are listening to The Leader Smith, Darren Gertis. Okay, so we're going to be talking about bad bosses. Actually, we're going to be talking about the worst boss survey. Uh, This was conducted at at the Denver Institute. And with me is the communications director of the Denver Institute. His name is Dustin Moody. Dustin, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be with you. So uh, let me give you some background of, of how we got here. I was working on a paper for the uh, Christian Business Faculty Association, and the paper, the research that I was looking for was on the temptations of leadership. Like, what are the temptations, the sins of leadership? What is, you know, what the leaders do that they shouldn't do? And along the way, I stumble over this interesting article called The Four Things That We Learned From Our Worst Boss Survey, which you wrote, which you put out. Yep. And um, as we got to talking about it, because uh, I thought <laughs> this is this is going to be great for the podcast. As we got talking about it, you're like, well, it's not, you know, like a professional survey. It's more, mm-hmm. somewhat anecdotal. People are, okay, that's fine. Um, but it's still worth talking about. So, um, actually, what drove the survey? Let me ask that first. What what got you going with that? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I work for Denver Institute for Faith and Work, and we can get into this a little bit later, but essentially we help believers uh, understand what it means to live out their Christian identity in the marketplace, wherever that might be. So a couple of years ago, I was looking at our calendar for content blog posts, and we knew that um, Bosses Day was coming up. I believe it's every October, where we typically celebrate good bosses, which is is good and right, and we should keep doing that. But we kind of thought, wouldn't it be interesting to talk about what a bad boss is? Mm-hmm. Um, and we thought there might be some interesting stories to learn from in hopes of kind of building up better bosses. So we put together this survey that we use with our constituents, uh, and then we turn it into a couple blog posts. And um, we've since used it across other platforms and things like helping inform some courses that we do and other podcast conversations that we run. Uh, but essentially, we wanted to hear from our um, our audience about their their worst boss experiences. Okay. And so when you collated this, you can't you reduced it to about four things that were important for us to hear. And you know, even though you said, well, look, I, this wasn't a, a systematic, you know, peer reviewed kind of something, even though sure. it wasn't, th- you know, academically rigorous, it still resonated with me. Now, I've been at this, you know, I'm a professor of management. I've been at this for about 20 years. So everything that you said rang true. So it might not have been exactly the precise order, but these four are certainly within a top 10 of the worst issues um, one way or another. So, so let, let's go through this and tell me, tell me what you found. Yeah. So there were a couple of consistent themes that we, we found throughout our findings. Um, for one example, we asked people to select what are the, the five traits that were in your bad boss, your worst boss. Uh, and more than half of our survey respondents indicated that bad bosses are almost consistently condescending, that there is an attitude of talking down, looking down, um, a, a just absolute condescension from some of our worst bosses. Okay. So now let me go back a step. So how many traits did you look at and, and ask them to pull from? I think we asked asked them to pull from about fifteen traits, okay, um, and we had some other like self uh, self directed responses, but um, yeah, fifty five point six percent of our survey respondents, over half of the population, uh, said their worst boss was condescending. Yeah, and I think that resonates with a lot of people. Like most people feel like they've they've run into they they've worked for that guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, and, and I, I'm no exception. I've had people that were like that. Why do you think that's the case? What do you think's going on there? You know, I think p- people might live into this idea that they are um, either structurally or as far as hierarchy goes, superior to the people below them, but that hierarchy shouldn't influence our communication. It shouldn't influence our relationships. Uh, even though I may report to someone and that someone exercises some measure of authority over what I do, even in my own workplace, um, we're, we're all believers, you know, we're all Christians and we should live that out in our relationships. Yeah. So Lord Acton was talking about power uh, tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I think he's right. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed at how little power it takes to go to somebody's head. Sure. And I see that even with my kids, like my eight year old 
telling my five-year-old what to do, like, you know, just lording it over. And I'm like, uh, guys, you know, I mean, but it, it doesn't take very much. Well, dad said I had to be responsible for cleaning this and you're going to help me. And <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take very much. I mean, when, when Frodo is talking about, uh, or not Frodo, uh, Gollum is talking about the precious, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it really does not take much. Okay, so that power, I think, infuses and creates that condescension. Is that is that fair? Is that what you... Um... Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think what, what we would offer in response would be, um, for listeners who may be in positions of agency or power or leadership or authority... What does it look like to steward that well on mm. behalf of your organization, on behalf of your team? Yeah. And so it's interesting that your choice of words, I was just talking to um, a couple episodes ago was uh, the steward leader. This was uh, Scott Roden. He is uh, he wrote a fantastic book. I use it in my graduate course is called The Steward Leader. And when you start thinking theologically and start really trying to bear down into that, and what, what would it mean if I was to steward the resources as unto God? Not not just I'm a manager, but like this is theologically motivated. It changes the way that you do things. I think a lot of the condescension will go away too when you start to do that because now you're starting to think like, well, you know, I made in the image of God. So is that employee that I'm condescending to. Sure. Maybe they have hopes and dreams and aspirations and rights and and I ought to be dealing with them diff differently. Yeah. And that's not to say there aren't areas where we need um, hard conversations. And actually in the survey we asked them to also share about their good bosses. And one of the one of the consistent findings that we saw there was that good bosses have hard but necessary conversations. So it isn't to say that we need to gloss over everything in the workplace, but how we have those interactions is really important. Yeah. And so bad bosses, uh, this was a huge finding. Was there anything else that got anywhere close to condescending? Like you know, the, you know, right after that numbers, numbers two through four, critical, dishonest, ignorant, and unreliable, uh, but far and away condescending was, was number one. Yeah. It was by a 15 point margin mm -hmm. higher than the next one down a critical if I, from yep. what I remember reading. That's, that's pretty amazing. That that's substantial. Okay. What was the second big finding? Yeah, so the second big finding uh, was that good bosses see the forest, bad bosses see the trees. Okay. Again, through some of our questions and our, our survey responses, bad bosses tended to take a, a myopic view on one aspect of the work. So they may be interested on um, expenses or monthly reporting or um, profit over everything else. And that there was this idea that bad bosses tended to lose sight of everything else that might be going on with their colleagues. Whereas good bosses took a more holistic view of relationships, of work, of the organization as a whole, uh, and sort of tried to balance all of those competing objectives. Why do you think that is that bad bosses tend to have that tunnel vision? I would guess that bad bosses who have tunnel vision, and this is just conjecture, uh, but are probably often... Um, evaluated on a particular set of criteria. So for their evaluation, they need to hit particular performance metrics that influences how they, um, how they focus on those with the people they work with. Yeah. I, I, I would argue you're probably spot on. Uh, I'm, I'm always amazed how tone deaf some bosses can be because they focus on one thing and others focus on another. So mm -hmm. as you know, I'm a professor, right? So uh, I'll give you an example from academia. There's so often a, a difference between what professors are focusing on and what the administration's focusing on. Absolutely. And so I, I've experienced this more than once where professors like, look, I want to have good students in my class. I want them to learn. I want to, you know, quality interaction. Uh, I'm interested in helping them grow. Ac academics tend to be like that. The administration tends to talk about how, the numbers, how many people are in the class, and, the, and it becomes a quantity versus quality issue. And I don't honestly. I mean, as long as everything's going okay and the, the institution isn't running off the rails, I don't really care a lot about how many more students that you have compared to what you had last year. That, that doesn't move me at all. I want to know how we're ministering to them, how we're mm -hmm. helping them develop. And so we're often talking past each other because we think, you know, one thing's important as opposed to another. Yeah. And to your point, Darren, how, or to your example, um, Ministering to those students is obviously vitally important, 
but you can't quantify that on a quarterly report to the board, right? That's we can't right. quantify our relationships or the ways that we're necessarily developing uh, the people who may work for us. It's still yeah. important, but if I'm not held to that standard, I may not focus on that or I may choose to focus on other things. Now, it's interesting that you talked about uh, you know, what's easy to quantify and what's not. Uh, Drucker talks about what gets measured gets managed, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so when you talk about quantifying, you can't necessarily quantify everything. So I'm Baptist and Baptists are notorious for, <laughs> you know, we're, we're counting how many, what our church attendance was, how yep. many baptisms, that kind of thing, because that's so much easier to, to count mm -hmm. than how deep the, they are discipled. Sure. And what's important is how deep people, how deeply they are discipled as opposed to, you know, how many showed up on a given Sunday, but it's not easy to measure or figure out, you know, are they really growing or uh, becoming what they should be? Yep. Okay. So that was number two. Uh, so bad bosses are probably condescending. Good bosses see the forest while bad bosses see the trees. Okay. Next one. Our next takeaway is pretty, also pretty consistent. Communication skills are the clearest separator between good and bad bosses. So we asked, uh, we asked our survey respondents to name what would make a good, or what would make a bad boss better. Okay. And it was communication skills, hands down. We also asked them what made your good boss good, and it was the way they communicated as well. Okay, so communication can be many things. So what what does communication mean here? You know, we didn't we didn't separate this out into kind of a different nuanced approach. Uh, but if I'm reading the survey results correctly and kind of making some inferences, and when you particularly look at things like um, condescension, dishonesty, unreliable, I think communication is is sort of like that interpersonal dynamics that we all run into, uh, mostly on a one on one or a one to team basis in the workplace. Okay, so you know. I Every time I stumble over something like this, it comes down to they don't when they when it, when it's bad, it comes down to like they didn't tell us what it was mm -hmm. or they're hiding something. They're not transparent or they they said it once and somehow we missed it. And they think, you know, as opposed no, what you need to do as a manager, you got to keep saying it. by the time that you're sick of saying it, they're just starting to tune in. Sure. So, again, the difference between where you sit. And, you know, how you perceive this could be very, very different. Okay, next one is, oh, go ahead. I was also going to say, I would add to that, I think, again, from what I'm putting together from the survey, clarity of communication is important. So we asked right. the five traits that des describe your best boss, and that's knowledgeable, hardworking, honest, respectful, and the decisive is part of that list as well. Um, you know, again, making the connection between the importance of communication, condescension, dishonesty, and unreliableness. It seems like there's a real need and a real value for clarity of communication. Again, even those direct, hard conversations that we need to have, but again, speaking the truth in love. Right. Okay. So the, the fourth one, rounding out the top four issues that you had. Yeah. So number four, the top four takeaways, good bosses bring more to their work than job competency. Which means? So we asked people what made a good boss good. And a lot of the responses that we got weren't necessarily related to their skill as a boss or their hard skills related to their work. It was things like uh, they're hardworking, they're honest, they're trustworthy, all these intangible benefits that come with a good relationship that may not be, again, um, evaluated on a personnel report or uh, found on a job resume, for example. Some of these soft skills that I'm sure you talk about on your podcast with leadership, um, you can be a great IT developer that does not make you a great IT manager, or you can be a great graphic designer. It doesn't make you a great graphic design manager. Yeah. So with that step up into leadership, what are the other qualities that, that we need to round out uh, to supplement what we can do well? Yeah. When you, when you said what you were just saying, I was thinking of the sales manager who's a great salesman and he becomes a terrible sales manager. And so, you know, you said you're more than your competency. The sales manager's competency, the, the salesman's competency rather, is to do the sale. He doesn't necessarily know how to get work done through people. Exactly. And the whole point of management, whole point of leadership is getting work done through people. And if you can't get that straight, everything else falls apart. Yeah, and I think I think this may be one of the more challenging ones for organizations to tackle as they think about moving people into different management positions. How do you judge or or analyze some of those character qualities that are necessary in a manager but may not show up um, as easily as hitting sales performance goals? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so those were the four things. Now, at the very bottom of that blog, you had you had just a little link, and it caught my attention. And this was fun. This it, you talked about like the the statements that people made about, uh, and this was another link. It, I'll put the links in, uh, below. It said, maybe my boss isn't so bad. And you were talking about what people said about their worst boss. So I, I'm not going to go over all of them. Just give me like the highlights of them. Like which, what quotes grabbed you or uh, what happened with these bad bosses? Yeah. So we were reading through our um, open and response questions uh, just to say, like, tell us a story about your worst boss. And we decided okay. there were so many interesting ones that we awarded some um, bad boss superlatives. So there are a couple that we can read through. Um, one that I put at the top of the list, most likely to get a call from HR. And I'll just kind of summarize this story. Uh, this team worked in an open office and the boss decided to have one-on-one -on -one meetings in a car, which regardless of your faith bent is probably a bad idea, right? Yeah. Uh, in this meeting, the boss asked, asked his subordinate to uh, explain or help him solve an HR issue. And then he basically handed it off to her to solve, um, which is probably well outside of her area of purview. Yeah, that that was not uh not not so smart. And if you think about it, like it doesn't take a lot to to go. Yeah, that that wouldn't have been a good idea. But I'm sure it made logical sense at the moment. Uh, <laughs> and you just just was wasn't thinking through it fully. Okay, what else? There there are some others, I'm sure. Yeah, this is an interesting one. We we, or, we awarded this one to most creative. It said one boss was narcissistic and loved to create chaos. My worst boss would always leave really late for the airport. One day they left so late they had to speed all the way on the shoulder of the highway. They were in a rental car and instead of returning the car, they drove to the passenger drop off, opened all the doors, threw the keys in the front seat, grabbed the bags and left the car there. They called the rental car company and screamed at them while asserting that the reason they were not able to return the car on time was because someone stole it. Yeah, you know, it, it's amazing how people do unethical, stupid things like that and then don't think that that's going to have an effect on the people who have obviously witnessed the stupid, unethical thing. And mm -hmm. like, w are we going to trust you after doing something like that? Of course <laughs> not. OK. Any more? Yeah. Uh, this one was our best at devising cost effective recognition programs at a staff meeting. Oh, I love this one. This was this was I think this might have been my favorite. Go right. Ahead. At a staff meeting, my worst boss celebrated the employees who used the fewest number of personal days and without an ounce of irony, gave them bonus personal days as their reward. Bonus personal days for using the least. That, that's, uh, that's impressive. And, well, and that, how many of us have been either in a situation where it is explicit or implicit not to use the vacation days that are afforded to us? Um, so I just felt like this one was just reinforcing that, that negative, negative approach. Okay. Um, there's my second favorite was the bagel shop. You want to tell me about that? Sure. Uh, this respondent said, I used to work in a bagel, bagel shop owned by a man we'll call Steve. One day, one of our regulars walked up to the counter with a quizzical look on his face. He leaned in and said to me, I don't hear any yelling. So I guess Steve must not be here yet. How horrible is that? Mm -hmm. That you would say something like that. Well, I don't hear yelling. So it must be what? Wait, <sighs> I mean, uh, but again, you know, everything that that you do, at, and you're going to talk about the, the Denver Institute in just a moment, everything that you do there with faith and work and, and trying to understand these things, your faith is telling you don't do these kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? I mean, again, if you're made in the image of God, I, I shouldn't be yelling at you. I shouldn't be treating you this way. I shouldn't be essentially lying in front of you or to you or whatever it is. And so uh, it, it's really interesting how faith mitigates this. And that's that was the whole point of the Temptations of Leadership paper that I'm mm -hmm. working on right now and, and where I found this. Okay, so with that, tell me about the Denver Institute, what you do, and uh, just because I'm sure that some people listening have not heard of it or don't know anything about it, and I'd just like them to get to know you. Yeah, absolutely. So we are, we're a Christian, we're a faith-based nonprofit, and we essentially believe that the gospel is good news both for our individual souls as well as the families, the organizations, the communities, and the cultures that we all live in. Um, you know, in Colossians 1.20 says that Christ is reconciling all things to himself. And we take that seriously, and we believe that Christians in the workplace have an opportunity to be 
active participants in that reconciliation work um, and really define the areas of brokenness in our relationships and our communities and, and address those as an aspect of our faith. So we believe that work is good. We see that it's created, um, you know, early in Genesis when Adam and Eve were given their assignments to cultivate and exercise dominion over the creation. But just like everything else, we believe the work is that our work is marred by sin. We're constantly working against that. So mm -hmm. as a nonprofit, we create um, content and events and educational re resources really to help disciple Christians to discern and live out their calling as believers through their work. And you have a lot of content out on your website. Tell people how to find the website and how to contact you if they're interested in more. Yes, you can find us at denverinstitute.org, D-E-N-V-E-R-I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E.org. We also run our own podcast as well called the Faith and Work Podcast. Uh, and if anyone is listening and would love to kind of reach out to learn more, you can email us at hello at denverinstitute.org or my personal email, dustin.moody at denverinstitute.org. All right. So um, everyone who listens to this regularly knows that I, I close with a quotation for contemplation. And, and I was, uh, I, as I knew what we were going to be talking about, uh, I, I came across or came back to this quote. And I, while I don't like Albert Schweitzer a whole lot, he's a humanist. He did some good humanist kind of works, but mm -hmm. he's not kind of my cup of tea. It, you know, he, he really tried given his framework, but his quote was phenomenal. And it was that this example is not the main thing in influencing others. It's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that it is the only thing, but it is huge. And if you like, you know, we're talking about these bad bosses and what they're doing. Their examples are horrible after horrible, after horrible, <laughs> after horrible example. Look, if you set that horrible example, you're going to be in this kind of category in the eyes of your people. So you, you have to learn how to recognize that your example is critical. My my children, um, as I train them, I have six kids uh, as, I, as I train them. The older ones, sometimes they go, well, they're not listening to me. Okay, don't talk. Just be an example in the way that you live. Well, that's not going to work. Try it. Just be an example. Just start cleaning up and let them pick up on doing it rather than bossing them around, telling them to do it. Example, example, example. And I, I think that will carry you a long way. Okay, yeah. I'm going to give you the last word. You can say anything that you want uh, about anything that we covered, whether it's bad bosses or the Institute or example or whatever. Yeah, thanks for that, Darren. I would say, um, as you think about some of these examples and these humorous stories that we've talked about, um, if it makes you appreciate your good bosses, let them know that. Like, let's yeah. help reinforce the good bosses that we have. Um, and, and let's learn from those areas as well. And that's great, because it turns out bosses are people too, right? Absolutely. Hey, who would have thought? Hey, Dustin, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on the podcast. And I hope that helps our listeners appreciate good bosses and not become those bad bosses. Thanks so much for having me.